Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part there are for the 28th of March 2024. Let's get to where we normally start, Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply, you can find them in the description to this video down below. A slightly shorter video today, I think, I predict, than uh, has been the last few days where they've been like 45 minutes long. Not so much analysis today. So... The figures for the Russian losses, 780 personnel, uh, 10 tanks. So both of those, fig well, 780 is kind of in the middle of the range that we've come to expect uh, recently. Well, actually, probably the lower end, even though that's, if you think about the range over the entire course of the year where we've had minimum days of sort of 300 and something, we seem to be long past that that time. The, the, the minimum now appears to be sort of in the 600s uh, and the maximum 1,380, I think, is our, is our largest uh, number in this category. And so 780 is actually the lower end, even though over the average of the whole war, it isn't. Uh, 10 tanks, uh, 21 armoured personnel vehicles. That's fairly significant. 10 tanks is, is you know, not... Not a small number of tanks to lose in a single day. 32 artillery systems is likewise a uh, fairly significant number. Two multiple launch rocket systems and one anti-aircraft warfare system. 56 vehicles and fuel tanks and six pieces of special, special equipment. So I think this is a, a challenging day for the Ukrainian, for the Russians again. Although the personnel numbers are not the highest that we've seen, they have lost a significant amount of equipment. Now, Andrew Perpetua hasn't gone out his lost list yet i'll just go and check actually see what his latest might be yep still no list so we'll have to wait for that one uh, until later tim white here says this is genuine uh i saw it a while ago but now anton gerishchenko has added english subtitles so what is this five out of every six of these invaders died for putin's sick dream yet he still doesn't pay what was promised worth dying for uh so anton gerishchenko here adding subtitles to uh, another Russian um, testimony video, I guess. Let's have a look at what these guys say. We are members of the Storm Z unit. We assigned contracts with the Russian Ministry of Defense on April the 29th. 230 of us left for a special military operation. There are 38 of us left alive. We're having trouble getting paid. Under Executive Order number 98, we have problems recognizing us as volunteers, participa participants of the special um, military operation. We don't receive certificates of veterans of combat operations. We have lots of missing persons, still missing. Relatives don't get money uh, for the missing. Guys somehow miraculously extend their volunteer contracts without contacting their relatives. Redut PMC, a veteran unit, uh, a famous one. We have a lot of questions and we need help and solutions to our problems because there is no other way. I'd like to add one more thing about the money when we signed a contract, it said about 195,000 rubles a month. In the end, we got 40,500 rubles. That's the salary of, for the contract plus combat pay. Uh, that is a maximum of 105,000 rubles monthly. That is, I personally, for six months, received only 600,000 on the VTB bank. Initially, the contract was signed. The amount was 205,000 per month. In fact, it amounted to a maximum of 100 uh, to 110,000. We signed a contract on a voluntary basis and we are volunteers. Now we come to the point where we have to prove our volunteer status through the courts. Um, I mean, this is this is so on and so forth. This is obviously, you know, incredibly challenging for Russians who put the, their lives on the line as volunteers here. These aren't so sort of mobilized, they're not from prisons, uh, but they end up in Storm Z units and they're being paid something like 40% of what, they should have been paid, which itself was half as much as they were initially expecting as well. So, my goodness, uh, not not great. But the numbers, 230, we're talking about personnel losses. Here is, yes, it's an anecdote. Can we extrapolate this? Not necessarily. But here is an example of 230 people being in a unit and 38 of them left alive. Um, that is absolutely catastrophic reduction in personnel numbers. A few bits of footage you can check out in the in the description below. The links should be there. Another Russian truck with a anti-submarine missile launcher installed on the back. That's what they look like. Uh, this is one of these kind of Franken. In this case, I don't know if it's Franken Sam. I don't know if it's a surface-to-air missile. 
because that's an anti-submarine missile. It's just a Frankenstein uh, vehicle that's been put together. Anyway, this is destroyed, hunted down by drones and destroyed. Um, and what else do we have? There's a river. Um, I think this is Magyar here. Yeah, so uh, Magyar's birds looking at a boat, a Russian boat on some, I presume somewhere in the Dnipro River Delta, where they are laying mines and they float onto one of their own mines and catastrophically, I guess, uh, what he calls it, <laughs> he calls it auto fellatio. Uh, it says this is a medical term, it's auto fellatio. <laughs> um, they've done it to themselves, basically. It is, um, yeah, uh, you can go and watch that video if you want. But not not too many other things that uh, kind of s s um, have shown themselves to me as significant videos to show you. Sorry, I'm struggling with words today, as often is the case. Let's move on to distant strikes, standoff munitions. 26 of 28 kamikaze drones launched by Russia last night were shot down. So another day of really good interception rates on drones. But Russia does appear to send over a range of missiles that Ukraine really struggled to shoot down, ballistic type missiles or anti-ship missiles or whatever. Anyway, three KH-22 cruise missiles, one KH-31P and S-300, so these surface-to-air missile systems using a ground attack mode, were also fired and there's no evidence that any of those were shot down. Actually, there's a number of places that were hit last night and yesterday. Uh, here we have uh, Jane Kiev saying this morning at 4 a.m. Russia sent seven ballistic missiles to Kherson State University. It's clear Russia only intends to occupy Ukraine after it's in ruins. The Ukraine without Ukrainians that Russians have dreamed of for decades. I, I mean, the question is, what was the intention of firing ballistic missiles? So these are ones that aren't shot down. And you assume they're finding their target there. The um, State University, is that, I mean, was it a genuine military target? It doesn't look like it. It looks like that those are classrooms that would otherwise be used for education and the Russians are just... Kherson's one of these places where I say that it's overt terrorism. Uh, as I've told you, I've been to Kherson and there are... Well, I didn't see a single military person inside Kherson, the, the city. Just, I didn't see any. They were just citizens tenuously hanging on to some kind of urban existence and every time a shell lands in Kherson in my opinion it is terrorism they are just uh, trying to exact some kind of toll on the civilian communities there they are not hitting military targets and this is another example I'm sure um, one of Russia's drones did get through air defense and hit transport infrastructure in Zaporizhia region. It was a concerted attack with 11 drones um, destroyed in the Zaporizhia Oblast. No one was injured, but fire broke out as debris fell on the private sector. Two people were injured, uh, and that's a sort of destruction we're seeing every night. You know, this is what the Russians do. Uh, in Kharkiv, yesterday, there was a double strike again. So the double tap is where they send a missile in. Emergency workers go and try and save people and, and put out fires and whatnot, and then they hit exactly the same place again um, to kill the emergency workers and, and break the spirit of the Ukrainians. One person was known to have been killed in an apartment, uh, in apartment buildings that were struck. The regional governor says 10 were wounded, but warns these figures may rise. Four children were among those wounded. And in fact, Kharkiv... Yeah, now 16 wounded in Kharkiv, says Tim White. Russia dropped an aerial bomb on the city for the first time since 2022. Gas engineers are now trying to ensure that it's safe. Now, Anton Gerashchenko talks about this. He says, yesterday Russia hit my native Kharkiv using a new aerial bomb, UMPB, so instead of UMPK, UMPB D30SN, for the first time. One person was killed, dozens injured, four kids among them. The youngest injured child was three months old, Kharkiv authorities state. Unlike conventional glide bombs, UMP B D thirty S N has a threefold increased range. That's significant. So it means the airplanes can drop these bombs three, you know, ninety kilometers away, uh, out of range of many short range and medium range air defenses, and still still damage, you know, 
at the end of the day, Kharkiv is right next to the border, so it's well within range of these sorts of uh, munitions. It's an analogue of the American GBU 39B SBD, SDB and has a range of up to 90 kilometres, as mentioned. Uh, what, what does this mean for Kharkiv and other Ukraine territories? Basically, it means that if our allies do not provide us with at least eight Patriot systems, that Kharkiv, Sumy, Zaporizhia and other cities close to the combat lines will get attacked with massive Russian aviation strikes. Uh, that will use such long-range glide bombs. It's interesting, the Ukrainians are supposed to be buying five uh, f directly from Raytheon, from RTX, uh, pa Patriots batteries. And I wonder when, I mean, it was announced by Zelensky the other day that two air defense systems have arrived in Ukraine that can shoot down everything. What was he meaning by that? Were they Sumpties? Were they Patriots? Was he just bigging up other things? Uh, the only effective countermeasure is destroying the Russian aircraft, uh, carrier aircraft as they get ready to launch the glide bombs 80 to 90 kilometers away from their targets. This can only be done by Patriot systems uh, that have be already proven themselves highly effective in destroying Russian military aircraft. Um, yeah. Uh, otherwise, we are facing an enormous increase to, of threats to civilian populations of these cities as Russia will make these will make new Mariupols out of them. Absolutely. Uh, and unable to take the city militarily, says Jane Kiev. Russians are now just massacring the civilian population of Kharkiv with missile barrages. So, yeah, missiles are still hitting Kharkiv. Glide bombs are hitting. Uh, Western allies sit by and withhold all the air defence systems that could stop it today. Obviously, he's constantly railing against uh, nations, his own uh, the US. He's really angry with um, consistently. A number of injured in yesterday's attack on Mikhailov, so this is another city that was hit yesterday, has increased to 12. Eight were hospitalised. A ballistic missile hit a factory, causing a fire. Six apartment blocks were also damaged. I don't know whether that's a genuine military attack, um, target or not, but it, it has um, Mikhailov has been hit. Uh, Ukraine keeps hitting Bel Belgorod hard on a daily basis. The city on the Russian side of the northern border is the de facto a big military base out of which a lot of missiles are launched towards Kharkiv and prepared and executed. So Belgorod, the reason why that gets hit so often is because these missile systems that attack Kharkiv are based around there. And uh, yeah, Kharkiv gets uh, a rotten end of the stick there. Um, and this is Ukraine trying to do something about it. Uh, French head to Ukraine says at this moment we can use our anti-ballistic system well he, he doesn't say that our anti-ballistic systems these are Sampti and Patriot which can inflict powerful damage and shoot down even such weapons this is going back to talk about the Sircon uh, the hyper or quasi aeroballistic hypersonic supersonic missile uh, that the Russians have started using more of um for the order of Aster 30 surface to air missiles, Monsieur Le Cornu should quickly use his priority power. So we're going to be talking a little bit about this later. France appear to be just going, oh, I was going to say something inappropriate then, really hard into this uh, war in, in support of Ukraine. They are um, just coming up with the goods at the moment obviously rhetorically with Macron, Le Cornu and others, and indeed uh, um, some French politicians who are running in the European elections, I think, talking a good talk about supporting Ukraine. They really are putting this at the top of the agenda, but also putting France onto a quasi-war footing in a way that other nations aren't really. Well, no, that's not quite true, actually. So the Baltic nations kind of are doing that the nordic nations do that and germany is kind of doing that so germany's hit back today by saying hang on we are spending crazy amounts of money at the moment and although we're not going to give the tourists and Olaf Scholz have come out again and said it doesn't want a nato russia war and that's why they're not giving tourists and it's easy to then tar germany with the tourist brush but actually they are doing an awful lot um but france particularly are are, are coming up with the goods you know macron going to places like Brazil to speak to uh, De Silva there, Lula De Silva, to try and convince him to support Ukraine more is incredibly important. Like looking at these key nations around the world and say, right, the like that's that that tells me that the one thing on Macron's mind at the moment is Ukraine, and he's got a lot of domestic issues to sort out, but he's putting Ukraine right at the top of the list, going on international 
diplomatic missions to try and convince incredibly key nations to start supporting Ukraine more. This is so super important. So hats off to Macron. I, I, I will continue to sing his praises because I think he's doing a damn good job of... He, he might not have always been in that position, but right now he's doing the right thing of, of supporting Ukraine. Right. It's a really fascinating, and I will report, repeat this in my mapping update today, later today, which will probably be live with Greg Terry. I'm going to do a live uh, at 1.30 UK time, catch up with Greg, see how he's getting on, and also probably do the mapping update then. Um, but this is Andrew Perpetua showing us a number, a range of Russian comments about attacks that they've just done that have gone badly because they are relying on pro-Russian mappers inference being here or the implication being here that Syriac maps with their claims of Russian control are one of these types of mappers so rubric more and more strange our infantry fighting vehicle so this is I think a thread more and more strange thread our infantry fighting vehicle was going on the attack. The infantry fighting vehicle was knocked out and the assault group was destroyed. Ukrainians and then our bloggers sketched the place where they finished off the group with drops behind us. The heading more and more strange we continue. Four of our infantry fighting vehicles were travelling. Three were shot down. One returned. Two infantry fighting vehicles managed to land troops. At the very extreme point, a group of six people landed and were covered with artillery. Ukrainians and then our bloggers draw this on the map in red. So the point here is that they're attacking places because they think they control it. And the, the rash and, and the evidence that they control it is being derived from open source intelligence mappers that are mapping these areas in red. So take Ivanivsky, and this is what this one talks about, where... Um, Surat Maps has that fully controlled in red, which is in line with sort of claims that come from pro, basically, Ministry of Defence telegram channels. This is what Andrew Perpetua calls them out on, saying, what are your sources? Because they are, you're not doing a lot of um, first-hand work yourself. You're deriving your claims from basically from the Russian MD or from these dubious sources, and then you're putting that on a map. And it turns out that then there's some kind of vicious cycle here whereby then the the russian soldiers then use that map and then it, it all goes wrong anyway on the 23rd of march the russian ministry of defense announced that it had taken control of the village of Ivaniska in the bakhmut direction the information is absolutely and completely untrue says a russian source however this information was not intended for russian citizens and certainly not ours but exclusively for russian soldiers who were sent to the western part of the village on March 23rd, 24th and 25th, having previously shown a statement from the Russian Ministry of Defence about complete control over Ivanivsky. Naturally, the Russian fighters not only failed to reach the western part of the village, they also did not have time to enter the central part because the Ukrainian armed forces inflicted fire on them along Shirakaya Street and Artyoma Lane in the eastern part of Ivanivsky. Uh, and then someone else saying here, uh, okay, on your fingers, uh, Ukrainian bloggers draw territories on maps for us, misleading us. And I would argue this is actually pro-Russian mappers doing this more. Our bloggers happily draw the same way uh, Ukrainians do. So it's blaming their mappers on just copying Ukrainian ones. So actually, I would say it's not quite the case. But anyway, too often what was sketched by Ukrainian bloggers began to not coincide with information from the field. In general terms, all of this drawn on maps by Ukrainians is taken as exact proof, and this is so. Uh, translating all of this, is it's, it's the idea that the Russians are, you know, Andrew Perpetua says, killing Russians with maps is a fine art. Us mappers are very dangerous people. But actually, you know, if they are... And this is not actually the first time we've heard this. We've heard this previously, going back, I think, to um, activity along Dnipro River and other places where the mappers have been incorrect. Uh, Russians go and act upon that, get themselves in trouble by landing in areas they think they control, but they don't control it. And then, and then you start wondering, well, what the hell is the intelligence doing on the front line? Well, like, what... To commanders in charge of units actually active in the area who are they talking to in, in terms of how do they get their information on what they control and what they don't and then you're thinking well it, does that mean that there's broken communication between units is it like is is there a broken communication going up the hierarchy do they go online to look at what what they control as being the most up-to-date 
Um, I mean, I do what I do for you guys sitting around the world in your houses or on your phones or listening while working or whatever. I'm not doing this to provide information for the Ukrainian army or the Russian army, right? But, uh, but the idea that there are units that are deriving kind of facticities, like veracity, truth from, um, from the, the maps they're looking at online and then sending troops in accordingly is, is in, insane to me. But that appears to be what's happening. And uh, they're getting themselves in a bit of trouble for doing so. And it shows that some of the Russian mappers are indeed inaccurate. Uh, account, uh, and the claim there is that Ukrainian ones are as well, by the way. Um, accounts like these should be banned from uh, Twitter and other social media platforms uh, for spreading Russian deliberate Russian disinformation. Says the evidence is undeniable, then proceeds to show no evidence. His evidence is, trust me, bro, instead of getting a ban, his account gets promoted on Twitter. And I'm going to go back to the disinformation war that we're having and people like Jackson Hinkle who is an American who is insanely pro-Russian and he's given you know amplification that's what the blue tick means he does have amplification he pays to have his voice get out further on Twitter and this is what Russia straight away as soon as that became coded into uh, into Twitter with what Elon Musk did he changed the blue tick from a verification to say that this is who you really are and change it to be where well, you can be anyone you're just paying to be able to say more you can have longer tweets with a blue tick and your tweets get amplified more. So the Russians then, with their troll factories, went, my goodness, the return on investment we can get for this. So people like me are like, well, I'm not going to pay Twitter to, to amplify my voice. And I'm really standing for truth here and trying to get truth out there. But I'm not going to do that because I don't want to put money in must pocket. But then you could argue that that would be a good... But I don't really use Twitter for, for me to say stuff. I get stuff from Twitter. But the Russian troll factory straight away then started loading up their accounts with blue ticks. Like $8 a month. I mean, if, even if you have... I mean, I don't know how much it is now. Whether it's Say say $10 a month and you're getting 10,000 of these. That's like $100,000 a month. You're thinking, well, that's a lot of lot of money, but actually, the the return on investment for spreading that that narrative out there in the world is incredible. And these guys will be commenting on not just the war in Ukraine, but U.S. politics, divisive politics in Europe. This is just money well spent. It really is money well spent by the by the Russians, and and that's a huge problem because the platform. Essentially, and the EU have done a report on this saying this Twitter is the platform that is the worst for disinformation. And and that's why it can be gamed so easily. Well, you can just, you can pay for it. You can pay to disinform the public uh, more easily through uh, through Twitter. Uh, here, someone says, uh, so Tomcat here says, I like your content very much, but I had to put my first comment uh, under your videos on a negative issue. So this is to do with the US calling out Ukraine for hitting refineries and then Matty Miller coming out yesterday, supposedly, although I need to find a, the actual source for that, uh, and saying that, that although there's something else that came out again today, uh, calling out Macron for, for troops into Ukraine and also calling out uh, strikes in... Yeah, anyway... Uh, so, th so this guy says, I had to put my uh, first comment under your video's negative issue. I totally disagree on your opinion about the statement of the US administration on strikes by Ukraine outside its territory. Noel's, Noel reports assumption, which you are supporting, is that the US is not allowing strikes on Russia. Actually, I didn't say they're not allowing them. I said that they're not in support of them, which I think is insane. Uh, but these rules on Ukraine and and put these rules on Ukraine and tied their hands behind their backs. This is simply not true. The US statement says clearly they do not encourage your support. So it, what I think what, where this guy's going is that this is more about optics and about actually stopping them doing stuff, which is simply a denying of the Russian propaganda proxy war uh, trap narrative. So the point here, and I think it is a good point, um, is that the US have to say that in order not to be accused of being in a proxy war. So that if they were in support of Ukraine, overly, overtly in support of Ukraine striking Russian territory, then they the US would be done for being in a proxy war much more obviously and would fall that would fall into the Russian narrative itself. So the the US 
have to say this in public, but behind behind the scenes, there might well be supporting this. And the Financial Times article that came out recently, which is talking about uh, anonymous sources, that again might actually be anonymous sources leaking stuff on purpose that may make it look like the US isn't in support. But actually, in reality, there's another layer under that, which they are in support. So there's an interesting discussion to be had around this, which says, in addition, the US has done nothing to prevent these strikes, which they would do if they weren't or aren't allowing them. The recent burning Russian refineries are some of the evidence for that. If there is or was a ruling or not allowing uh, the Ukrainian long distance strikes would never happen. But in addition, I find the opinion not only wrong, I find it very toxic. The false narrative is consistent, uh, consistently building up in the U- pro-Ukrainian sphere and demanding more and more attention on issues that are not related to the actual ongoing events. So he's basically saying, look, just don't talk about this. Don't give this the oxygen. The Financial Times, he says, giving it the oxygen, me giving it the oxygen by talking about it. Financial Times article over the alleged US demands against the refinery strikes from last Friday, for example, basically the same issue, was denied by the Ukrainian presidential spokesperson via RBC Ukraine on the same day. Literally everyone talked about the alleged claims in the FT article, but no one talked about the denying. The seeds of distrust between the Allies uh, and isolating Ukraine further, who would profit from that? This seeds distrust, sorry. I would prefer that we do not waste so much of our energy on emotional driven assumptions of dissent. We should focus on productive and lucrative solutions within the Western Alliance that keeps the pressure and, and, and keeping pressure on it. The reshuffling of the $300 billion frozen assets, for example, would be a real game changer. With these, Ukraine certainly um, could obtain capable weapons systems or, com- uh, or components for them. Uh, without asking anyone for rules or permission and would, sol- um, and would solve any of the issues above. Okay, so hopefully you get an idea of that language issues and whatnot. But um, I, I think that's interesting that, that there could well be this level underneath that isn't prima facie um, not wanting Ukraine to hit those refineries or those key uh, key targets within Russia. Uh, but actually, they are in support of that. They just can't say it. It's worth reminding ourselves of Russian propagandists because kind of this is what they really think, right? Meanwhile, in Russia, Vladislav Shurigin uh, told Vladimir Solovyov, the main propagandist, really, uh, it's him and Simonian, that Ukrainians are animals who don't understand anything human. He suggested using cluster munitions and wiping out entire towns where Ukrainian soldiers' wives, children, and parents live. Children and parents live. Like, why doesn't that get played to Marjorie Taylor Greene? Why doesn't this stuff get played to Jackson Hinkle? Why doesn't this stuff get into the uh, information spaces? Why is it not played more ov- overtly on CNN, on Fox News? That would be nice. This is what Russians are really saying. And this is why it is morally uh, incumbent upon, morally obligatory for the US or for any nation with a moral backbone to support Ukraine. This is who the bad guys are. Anyway, uh, that aside, thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate your support. Take care. Speak soon.